Welcome to the girls. If you missed part one, you can go back and review, but today we're going to have our special guest back again, Dr. Christine Kreisinger, and she is going to continue on with our talk and discussion about relationships, boundaries, saying no, and how to be happy. I'll drink to that. You know? With Beninas, right? So Beninas, uh, we're here at the mall and they've given us graciously a red and a wine, a white wine, so we're on show two. And yeah, and we just want to be so sociable, right, Laura? We're hopefully still on the last one, but... Christine, thank you so much for coming back. And oh, you're welcome. joining us with this. We've had so many great responses to this because everyone, no matter you're where you are in your life, you have relationships. You know, whether you're married, you're single, you're young, you're old, you're a man, you're a uh, woman, whatever, we all have relationships. And we get like so turned around with what is right and what isn't right. And I think we hold back our own feelings because we're always trying to please everybody else. So let's set the boundaries. We could recap, Janine, from yeah, what we what, did last what time. What are the boundaries when you talk about, we talked about being happy, it's okay to be happy. When you, how do you set that boundary? It's okay for, if you're happy, does that mean you're being selfish? And as a <sighs> woman, sometimes it's, oh, if I'm happy, well, you have children. Now, is that, are the children not happy because I'm happy? So it's, it's, I think it's easy to say, here are the relationship rights. I think it's harder to put them into action without guilt. Yeah, I want you to imagine, I have two brand new nephews, mm -hmm. um, six month old and um, I think uh, Ben is not even a month old or he's a little over a month. But when I look at both of those babies, right, they have the right to be happy, mm -hmm. undeniable. Sure. They have the right to be happy. Well, I was a baby once, and you were a baby once. So what happened along the way to have you doubt that, right? So we, again, we don't need to earn these rights. I have a fundamental right to be happy and to seek happiness, just like I would wish that for another person. I mean, I, I feel that way about my best friend. You know, she has the right to be happy and to do whatever it is that she needs to do to secure her happiness. Let me give you an example, mm -hmm. Em. Someone is unhappy for 20 years. You know, you're talking, someone builds these wrong habits for 20 years and then you say to them, you deserve to be happy. So saying these relationship rights, you deserve to be happy, how do you teach them to actually put that into action? The first step is introducing them to the rights and letting them know that these are yours and you don't have to earn them. Mm. You know, you don't need to, to ease into them. These are your rights. And that, one of the reasons I love presenting these is because when I say them, the way that they land for people, like right here in their hearts, you can see their faces. Again, it can be a 16-year-old, it can be a 76-year-old. There is a very similar response. It's sort of like an aha moment. I didn't realize that I had these rights. And you just sort of plant the seed. For someone who's been living with one right or many rights violated over time, you just, it's gonna be difficult to change those patterns to, so that that person can come into a protection of these rights for him or herself. Does you it, have to plant does, the seed. Does it also, the advice that you give or the words coming from someone, does it matter who's telling you that? Is it different hearing it from your mother telling you that? Is it different hearing it from your friend telling you? Is it different hearing it from a therapist telling you? It's inter that's an interesting question. Um, yes, it is. It depends on how you, know, how you hear it, at the time of life that you hear it, the situation you're in when you hear it, right? Um, this is how I like to think about that issue. There are four people in my life that are on what I call the board of directors of my life. So that if I've got something really big going on or an issue that I'm really grappling with, or if I need to be told something for my own good, and it comes from one of my board of directors, I'm gonna hear it. 
those are the women, they're all women, that I'm going to go to when I need sound advice, when I need honest and authentic feedback. And it's surprising who those women are because they're not even women in my life that I talk to on a daily basis, but I know that when I am in need, I'm going to the board. Well, how do you select your board? Because we have so many women in our lives. How do you know who to listen to? It's you like prob you probably already know who your board is. You probably know. Your or you learn your board through, it's almost like, you know, Oprah says you, you see who your friends are when the limos broke down, broken down. <laughs> it's true. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because when you have things happen in your life that someone else isn't benefiting from, that you need them there for you, you find out who your friends are. And it might not be that friend you thought it was or the person in your circle that you thought it was. It might be someone, like you're saying, that maybe you talk to four times a year. Yeah. It's for me, the, the, the women who have made it to the board of directors of my life are women who I know that their advice or their feedback is always going to propel me forward. Sure. It is not going to keep me stuck. And they don't and have it's an not take me back. in what the, their, their information is to you as far as their opinion. All right, I have to stop you again because it's time for a break. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Welcome back to The Girls. We're here with Christine Kreisinger. Christine, I'm listening to all of these relationship rights and I would think that if I were in a relationship that my rights were being violated Eventually, mentally, that has to take an effect on a person. Yeah. What, what starts to happen? I would think, you know, I, I have friends who I, would, I watch their relationships and they become depressed. Mm -hmm. And you tell them time and time again, this is what I think you should be doing and how I would handle this. But what happens? What, how does that all start to break down when we were violated? When you're in a relationship where many of the relationship rights are violated, so if you look at all 25, and we only highlighted the big ones, the, pe the ones that w women in particular tend to really respond to re regardless of their age. You find that if five or six of them are violated, if you look more holistically, you'll see, ooh, there's a theme here. Most, of, most all of these are violated. When that happens, inevitably, there's going to be depression, there's going to be anxiety. And what we know about depression and anxiety, I call them the twin sisters they most often travel together. I mean, imagine living in a relationship or many relationships within which your rights are violated constantly, how you would feel. You sure, know, it takes um, away from who you are. Resentment, anger, and eventually shut down, right? Sure. We might fight for a while. We might try to leave. Stress response kicks in big time, right? And when we are flooded, when we are flooded because we feel trapped and we feel voiceless and we feel boundaryless, we want to leave, we want to fight. The freezing part is really significant, especially for women. It's just this total shutdown. It's almost mm -hmm. like being suffocated slowly. It's like, I can't, uh, uh, and then you just give up. You know, I, uh, I was teaching about emotion to a group of children. I had a four-year-old in the class, a four-year-old girl, and we were talking about expression, expressing anger in particular, and I was asking them, where do you feel anger in your body? You know, and, oh, I, I feel anger in my belly. I feel it in my chest. Sometimes I feel it in my head. And she said, when anger comes, it's here. Mm -hmm. And I said, tell me more. And she said, I feel like I can't speak. And what she meant was she wasn't allowed, she wasn't given permission in her family home to be angry. That's a violation of a right. You know, I have the right to feel what I feel. Now I don't have the right to act out in a crazy way related to how I feel, but I have the right to say to you, I'm angry. We were talking before about different ages and age groups, how things affect mm -hmm. age groups, which I found so totally interesting. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to touch on that just a little bit and share that with our audience? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. it's so different as we get older, how things, I guess because of learned behavior or 
because of what stage you're in our life, but if you could touch on that. The prevalence of both anxiety and depression in this country is really high. And when you look at statistics, especially recent statistics from the um, National Institute for Mental Health, you see anxiety and depression higher in women, right? Almost always higher in women, higher in teen girls. Right? So when you start to break that down over the course of a woman's life, you see that there are certain things that occur in certain stages of life that can lead to anxiety and depression. For example, um, during the 20s and 30s, between age 20 and you know, mid age 20 through early 30s, usually depression and anxiety is related to personal relationship, professional direction, I'm not quite sure where I am professionally, and trying to create work-life balance, especially if, if she's having children, she's trying to figure that out. Late 30s into late 40s, you come into questions of life inventory. Am I living the life I wanna live? That's where you see women, and we sometimes say, oh, she's having a midlife crisis. She's not having a midlife crisis, she's claiming a life for herself. So we see many women making changes or wanting to make changes and they feel stuck, then the anxiety and depression is present, okay? 50s into late 50s, I'm gonna claim the life I want. And we see many women really shaking it up, quitting their jobs, moving to a different state, choosing the relationship that they most wanna be in because there's this sense that I don't have a lot of time left. There's this real felt sense that my life is limited. When that's not addressed, this very real need to claim the life that I want, when it's not addressed, you're gonna see anxiety and depression. And then 60s and beyond, we see this desire to catch up you know, to connect more deeply to others. We see this desire to combat loneliness. We, th we see this desire to be seen, right? Ages and is real. Um, women in particular who age will say, I feel like I'm invisible, or I've become invisible, or I'm not listened to, no one can hear my voice. So these are critical phases of a woman's life that need to be addressed, they need to be voiced, they need to be acted upon, but more often than not, they're not. Well, is and it natural for see. those to occur in mm -hmm. each stage, or is it something that carried over from what you didn't address in the first decade? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, if you didn't address it in that decade, it's not like it all goes away. Just you know, worse. it just then accumulates. So imagine the pit of despair that, you know, and I mentioned this in the first show, that I might be at when I'm potentially on my deathbed, mm -hmm. saying, wow, the time, time is over. You know? And this is the life I lived. This is the life I lived, right? Well, we want you to live your best life and we have more information for you, so don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Christine, we've been talking a lot about all these relationship rights and how we can you know, get involved in making a better relationship. But we've also talked now about the violation of those rights and depression. What if I am in that state of depression? What can I do? Is there something you can recommend that can help me you know, to maybe come out of that or something before, just to give me a little bit of an, a relief from it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I would love to share with you a practice that you can use anytime, anywhere, and its impact on your biochemistry and your neurology and your hormones is such that um, it can begin to lift you out of that depressed state and really calm you down if anxiety is present. Okay, so I want to lead you through it. You ready? Right. I okay. think everyone here and everyone, everyone at home should yes. do this. Yes, absolutely. Do this as well. Get mm -hmm. comfortable. So I would like for you to sit back in your chairs so that your spine is supported, but it's also nice and tall. Okay, and I would love for you to have your feet hip width apart. Nothing is crossed. 
and just settled onto the floor, hands just resting here on your knees or on your thighs, and I want you to close your eyes. Oh my gosh, I might fall asleep. You're gonna close Ooh. your eyes. Good night. So I want you to really feel these feet against the floor and grounded against the floor. And I want you to feel that although the spine is supported, it's nice and tall and dignified so that you have that sense of dignity. And I just want you to allow the shoulders to kind of drop down and bring them back a little bit so that you feel an opening, an expansion through the chest and the heart. And we're just gonna stay just like this. Nice gentle breath in and out through the nose. The spine nice and tall and dignified. Your feet grounded into the floor. And the heart, the chest, spacious, expansive. And you're in perfect form and I also want you to just relax into it. The feet grounded into the floor gives you a sense of strength. The spine, tall and dignified, provides a sense of calm. And the shoulders down and back allows you to open the heart. And from this calm place, I just want you to gently open your eyes. Now, I want to tell you what happened. Okay. It takes about 45 seconds to two minutes to create hormonal shifts, chemical shifts, in grounding the feet, centering the spine, and bringing the shoulders down and back. When we center in the spine, right, so the spine is relaxed, but it's tall and dignified, we begin to turn down our cortisol production, our stress response. That calms us. When the feet are grounded into the floor, hip width apart, nothing crossed, we bring up just a little bit testosterone. Men and women produce testosterone. We bring it up just a little bit, and it creates a sense of strength and confidence. This is my favorite part. When I take the shoulders down and bring them back, I start generating serotonin and oxytocin. So oxytocin is the bonding hormone. It's the hormone that women produce when they give birth to bond with their child. It's the hormone that two people have a lot of production of when they're falling in love. We want to be close. We want to offer our hearts. Our potential for compassion and empathy just expands when there's lots of oxytocin, or oxy, yeah, oxytocin. So imagine what it would feel like and what it would be like to move through life feeling calm, strong, and open. So I'm never getting up. <laughs> I'm going to sit like this. Could you imagine going really? into a conversation where you might have a conflict or getting up to give a speech and you feel calm through your spine, strong through the feet, and completely open? So how, when should we do this? How often anytime. should we do this? And just anytime. Anytime throughout the day. Anytime throughout the day. And you can also do it from a standing position. But this has been scientifically studied that this is what happens in our bodies hormonally between 45 seconds to two minutes of doing, making those three postural shifts. Strong, tall, dignified spine does what? Centers and Centers, balances you yeah. and makes you get con gets confidence. Yes, gives that, we reduce the cortisol. Strong through the feet, testosterone. brings up testosterone, testosterone, so we have a sense of strength and confidence, and yet we're open, right? The production of oxytocin. Like a peacock. Yeah. So Hope you're practicing at home. 
Serotonin <laughs> and oxytocin are natural remedies for depression. And we could all use an infusion of both of those hormones. And we can all use the reduction, the turning down of cortisol. Because if there's too much cortisol, if we're producing cortisol all the time, we are an anxious mess. So that short practice can help you to better manage. It's not a complete remedy for anxiety and depression, but it can help you to manage it. All right, well, you've given us a lot of tools lot, to work with yes. to become superheroes. And I think we can all put up our shield. Uh, there is so much more information that you can offer people. Do you do one-on-one -on -one counseling? I well? certainly do. Okay, yes. and where can people get in touch? Christine at CEKcommunication.com. It'll be in the show notes. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for joining us. Thank I you. learned a lot. I, I love hope. being here. Yes. We love That's having really you back. <laughs> Exactly. Thank you yeah. so much for Thank joining you. us. I hope that you've learned some things today. I hope that it's the first step for you. If you could seek out Christine or a friend, one of your board, the chairman of the board, yeah. you, know, you be yeah. the chairman and pick out your board. But uh, whatever it is, we hope that you have a very happy life. We hope that we've helped get you started in the right direction. We'll see you next time on The Girls.